All right, so welcome to FinOps Friday, episode number two, and this is all about getting your organization ready. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest areas that we really need to focus on, uh, not just because I personally think it's really being neglected in the industry right now, but because it's so impactful. It's an area that can really deliver just immense value to your business. Without it, you're not really gonna be achieving much. Uh, you, know, you can have all the tooling and all the magical and somewhat meaningless KPIs, but nothing will actually be will actually beat people doing the work. Uh, and of course, if you can prove me wrong on that, feel free to email feedback at finopsfridays.com. So with that in mind, we've got Matty Yeasel here to give us all the answers on how to get your organizations ready for FinOps. But just before we do introduce Matty, uh, for the, the astute amongst you, yes, he is currently working here at Aptio. Uh, the one challenge that we have is that it is pretty hard to get guests from big, large, public, well-known companies to come on and say, this is what we do bad and these are the problems. They're publicly traded companies. Uh, so this is a way where we can get somebody on to talk about some of the challenges and some of the mistakes people have made to be able to get those really good, meaningful war stories. Uh, also, if we have somebody on from a company, we've got one company's views and insights. So again, by having somebody that's worked with many, many different companies, we can get a much better viewpoint and hopefully make sure that this content's a bit more relevant. So this is why we've got Maddie. So over to you, Maddie. a quick introduction yourself, your background and uh, what you love doing with customers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Maddie Yazel, Principal Solutions Architect here at Aptio Cloudability. Uh, I've been with Cloudability for about five years now, helping customers with visibility, you know, optimization, and operational challenges in the public cloud. Uh, I do. I have a non-technical background historically, political science and history major in school, and I kind of fell backwards into accounting for technology startups in California. While I was doing that, I discovered a nasty line item in almost every single technology startup that no one knows how to explain, which is the AWS bill. Uh, and I slowly fell from cloud accounting to real cloud accounting, uh, which has now brought me into the FinOps world. You know, I always like to say my real skill is being able to explain cloud like I'm five to others across an organization. And I think we'll talk a lot about how, you know, being able to explain tough technological concepts in simple ways to executives, to finance, to different parts of the business is, is a keystone of a good FinOps practice and, and building up that maturity at your own organization. So looking forward to talking to you today, Nathan. Awesome, we have a real person. I love it, let's get into it. Uh, first topic, executive sponsorship. Uh, you know, there's gonna be big, big changes across the organization. We're potentially talking really big money. We're gonna have to be implementing people, there's processes, there's of course tooling. All of this has to be uh, invested in by the, by the organization to be able to realize the benefits long-term from doing FinOps. Uh, a key part of this is gonna be executive sponsorship, making sure you've got the right person at the right level, in the right position to be able to drive that throughout the organization. Maddie, who makes a good sponsor? Uh, and also, you know, who doesn't make a good sponsor? Where have people chosen potentially the wrong sponsor? What have you seen? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think it, it depends a little bit on the size of an organization. Uh, I will say, you know, in a super large, like a strategic, you know, Fortune 100, 500, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the CTO or the CIO who's leading this initiative. That might be a little bit too high level. That might not be close enough to the problem to really, you know, break down the blockers, things like that, that you need. Uh, I'd say the big requirement for an executive sponsor is it's someone who is, hasn't entirely left the actual like operational side of the business and still knows the right people across engineering, uh, the business and the finance space and has a vested interest in getting this right. Right, so someone who, you know, a good portion of the technology spend may roll up to this individual, right? Or they may be someone who is going to get a tap on the shoulder if the teams come in, you know, 25% over budget across the board this year. And so I'd say, you know, someone who is close enough to the work, who knows who is actually going to be doing the hands on the keyboard, the teams that will be involved, but isn't necessarily a part of any one of those teams. And then someone who, you know, has direct responsibility over the end result of cloud and has a vested interest in kind of getting the financial area, uh, the financial portions under control. And then finally, you know, this goes for almost any initiative in your business, but someone who can actually break down the silos at your organization. Right. So obviously, again, someone too high up that's not involved may not be the right person. 
um, a solid, you know, vice president uh, or something who is like right in the thick of it, I think is a good executive sponsor to, to actually help you get things done across the org, which is the hardest part. I mean, in my experience, companies that, that haven't done this work and have tried to go totally bottom up with FinOps are often hit with roadblocks by different teams who might not think cost is their problem or things like that, as we all know. So just having someone that can bridge the gap, I'd say, is, is the most critical thing to, to finding success early and not uh, not feeling like you're you're pushing a, a roll of boulder up a hill, if that makes sense. Yeah, nice. And, and on that, like when companies get it wrong, uh, what are the signs they need to look for? Like what are some of those telltale signs like that the viewers are going to be like, that's me, I've got the wrong person. Um, yeah, what are, what are those signs that they can look for? Yeah, I'd say one of the big signs is that <clears throat> there's only one team involved, right? Like if you're a finance department and you're trying to do this all by yourself and you can't really get people from engineering involved, uh, you can't really get any product owners involved, it's probably a good sign that, that you're too siloed, that you don't have the right person to kind of knock those doors down. Uh, I'd also say, you know, on an early FinOps program, I would try to figure out who at my organization, you know, is going to care about this and then find out who those people report to. And I've often found that you'll see, you know, there's the finance team who reports to one individual, say they want them to be the executive sponsor, but really, you know, engineering product, the cloud CCOE all report to, you know, not the CFO, maybe they report to the CTO or someone else instead. And overall, you know, those three parts of the business have probably a more vested interest than just the CFO by himself. And so, you know, things like that are trying to make sure who's actually coming to these meetings and who has a general interest in doing this across the organization and making sure that, you know, an executive who is too far removed isn't the one who's kind of put his name on this, but isn't actually doing a lot of the, you know, the work to push it through and get it done across the organization. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And in terms of like, what, what, are they, what do you see when people get it right, potentially when they change from having the wrong sponsor to the right sponsor, or they've just nailed it and got the right sponsor? What are those telltale signs? What are those steps and, and behaviors and changes in culture that you see uh, that really indicate, yes, we're doing this right, we're on track? Yeah, so I mean, again, I think, you know, the number one change you will see with a good executive sponsor is collaboration across the, a wide group of stakeholders, right? Like I always know if someone comes to me and, and you know they need some really good cloud or they really good cloud financial reporting, but they can't get anyone to look at it. Uh, that's often like a big problem, right? They'll say, you know, I, we have these reports, they're curated, but only three or four engineers are really looking at the data. And to that, to, to me, that means that someone needs to come over across the top and kind of tell the teams that there's a culture shift happening, and that they're yeah. going to have to start looking at new pieces of information cost is now a part of their day job or a part of the things they need to consider and you know that doesn't always come off as well from someone you know side by side to you at the organization it's hard for finance to tell engineering what they need to care about just like it's hard for engineering to tell finance what they need to care about so i often find once you have the right person you notice that those silos break down very quickly uh, and i often find that you know this person does tend to be more of a technology executive than a finance executive a lot of the times it is a technology individual with you know a business-like mindset who can kind of get away from you know the coolest new tech and the coolest new SKU types to see you know a little bit more strategically about what the company is consuming versus like oh man i gotta go try this in lambda asap right which is a, a different persona but still one that we love here yeah, awesome. And I like the fact that you've highlighted the fact that there is going to be friction. Like if there's friction, that's not a bad thing. Friction means that you're doing things right by introducing change. It's the fact that you can resolve that friction quickly because you've got the right resources. So uh, nice points. I like that. I on Sorry, one more thing to add there before Go we ahead. move on is I love yeah. what you just said about like friction or I call it tension. Like there should be tension or at least a little bit uh, constructive tension between these groups, right? Like you know, finance would love it if you tagged everything with 15 different tag values that lined it neatly up to cost center and deliverable, things like that. You know, engineering doesn't have the cadence to, to make sure there's 15 tags on every resource. So like finding that healthy middle is so critical. And if, if you don't have at least a little bit of tension across these different departments who all have different responsibilities, then what that tells me as a practitioner is, is you're, you're avoiding some hard work that needs to happen. 
Right. Um, if everyone See, is I'll, super I'll argue. I'll, I'll, like, like, tension to me is a bit static, whereas friction, you got movement. So yeah. <laughs> we can okay. argue until the cows yeah. come home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the terminology, but the, the, the thing <laughs> you need to say is, like, you know, if, if, if finance goes, you know what? Engineering doesn't want to tag stuff, so it's just too hard. Let's just not tag it. Right, like that, that gets you out of a tough conversation. It doesn't help you seven months down the road when you need to allocate back to these complex different product groups, right? So I think friction is yeah. probably a better term than tension, but you know, um, <laughs> a good compromise, a good compromise means someone's leaving, everyone's leaving something on the table, right? Which is, is critical. Yeah, and we'll cover that a little bit later in terms of, you know, how do we make sure that we've got, you know, an aligned vision and also some motivation. Uh, but before we do, uh, why do we need a dedicated function? That's one thing that we talk about. There's got to be dedicated. And that's the one thing I tell customers. What, what's the one thing I can do to really make a difference? Give, just give me one thing. I'm too busy. I've got everything else to do. give me one thing. And my answer is always, you need to hire a person. Once you invest, you know, you're putting that stake in the ground. You're really putting some skin in the game to say, we, we're going to do this. We're, we're an organization that cares about this. So a lot of people do freak out when they say, you know, all of, you know, I need to hire a person and do a heap of stuff. But you know, that's the first step. You know, eating the elephant, making sure you're running a marathon. Take the first bite. Take that first step. You don't have to have an entire fully qualified team tomorrow, but you know, you've got to have that dedicated function. If you're small and beginning, maybe it's two out of the five days a week type of thing. Maddie, can you be effective part time if you don't really have that dedicated function? What have you seen? Yeah, so again, that, that, that's definitely for me a, a scale question. And I find, you know, if you're an early stage company, you have one product, right? And, and there's not a ton of differentiation between product lines, types, lines of business. You can, you can get away with having maybe a part-time resource at first, right? And I think that's how a lot of people start this role is they become, they're technology-minded individuals that know a little bit too much about finance and slowly and surely get kind of taken down this path. And, but once you hit scale, and, when, and in scale doesn't necessarily mean you know, $5 million a month in cloud. I think it means you know, multiple product lines, you know, multiple engineering teams, and just different groups that are working on different areas of the cloud and are siloed apart. You do need a dedicated function to start to try to bring all of this data together and curate it for executives, uh, for finance, for engineering, so that everyone has the same data. Um, you know, we find companies try to do this piecemeal at first almost all the time. Like it, it starts out of the cloud CCOE or out of their TBM office if, if they're, you know, a large, like a large on-prem TBM style shop. But after a while, I think you're completely right. Like I think someone gets tapped out and says, you know, I can't just do this two days out of the week and hit the results that my organization needs, right? Like we're not going to optimize, um, you know, 20% off of our bill or get to 92% reserved instance coverage doing this two days a week. Um, it's just a sheer fact of the data coming from cloud is just such a huge data portion uh, every day coming from your Cur file, BigQuery, whatever it might be. And eventually, you know, it does take at least, and again, it's, it's different for every org. I've seen large organizations with, you know, one to two people who are doing it very well. I've also seen large organizations start to tap, you know, their entire finance team to be like financial co-pilots with, with, the, with the engineers. So I have seen a different level of engagement across how many people are in your team. But I think, again, once you hit that level of complexity where you have more than three to six engineering teams that are all working on different products and need to be aligned and have a strategic vision, um, you will need at least one to two people kind of managing this at your organization. And they're usually part of the CCOE but I do think it's, it's its own distinct branch that is specifically focused on the financial operations versus say like security or compliance or performance management, right? And most organizations have tons of people doing things like security and performance management. So overall, I think you can get away with a smaller FinOps team than maybe some of those other parts of the org. But I do think you know, you're gonna hit that scale and require at least a full-time full person leveraging a product um, and likely more than that if you're, if you're trying to build off of the native functionality and things like that as well. Yeah, I will point out, uh, you mentioned TBM. For our viewers at home, TBM, Technology Business Management, when we talk about FinOps in the cloud, it's sort of the same concept, but you know, IT spend, technology management, having good structures, having good processes and everything in place to manage your IT spend. So this sort of goes back well before 
cloud kicked off. Um, in terms of the size, like normally I tell customers, you know, where do I need to get to? Well, let's paint the vision. How many do I need? Well, let's mm-hmm. look at where you need to get to and what that journey and that sort of is going to be like. And say, well, you know, how much do you invest now in security in things like operations? Well, you know, FinOps should eventually be that size. That's going to be whole teams processes. Like you're going to have to build up to that. So I sort of lay that as a vision. That's where you need to get to over however long build your road. Would you sort of agree with that? Or is there any other tips and tricks in terms of how do I get the right size for me now and know when I should be hitting some milestones to that, you know, to that end vision? Yeah, I mean, I would say it, it's, I, I don't have like a definitive size for like, if you're spending 20 million, you need three people, right? I feel like so much of it really does come back to like the business complexity and how some of the business operates. Again, you know, a single product um, can be somewhat straightforward and take a lot less time than like, you know, um, a full portfolio for a Fortune 100 organization with, you know, hundreds of different products, right? Good um, but I will say, I have seen, you know, I've seen teams as big as like 20, uh, managing like day-to-day, full-time managing this for a huge organization with, with a lot of complexity. Um, and then I've seen teams closer to two or three for arguably a similar size and spend, but a much more simple business line, a much more simple kind of uh, allocation strategy, things like that. I'd say the big milestones you wanna look for again is like when you start to notice complexity. So, you know, if you wanna start to divvy things up by like division or line of business or cost center, and you start to have 20 to 30 of these different allocation buckets, that likely means to me that you're gonna have to start to need headcount were that to expand any further. Right. So, so like as is it is it better to look at the size of your finance team and operations instead of your actual bill? Is that then a better approach? Yeah, I mean, so I guess first off, your availability of who in your finance team can actually support this type of work is obviously huge, unless you have like open headcount for the role, which is which is fantastic as well. I mean, we're seeing that more and more companies are clamoring for this kind of talent to to help manage this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely say like I would look at like overall, you know, size of the billing file, you know, complexity and like how many different product lines you have to organize and knowing to support one of these product lines, let's say I need one person, right? I'm now going to expand to five or six. Like what does that naturally mean for my business? I think makes more sense than just saying, oh, our spend went up 5% this month. We need to hire another person. You know, if that spend all came from the same EC2 instances, just more of them, that might not be the case. Right. And I think that's a, that's a really important distinction for me because I find customers, they're like, you know, I'm spending X amount, you know, I must need all of this stuff. And that can often be true, but it, it's not necessarily just size of the bill. I think it really is, yeah. gets into a complexity problem and like the architecture of your business, which AWS and cloud billing doesn't do a great job of mimicking on their own. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll sort of throw down, I'll double down on the, my opening remarks, your honor, in that you know, nothing beats speaking to a person. So you're talking about complexity. Now, current complexity, but also take into account future complexity. If you're about to increase your business operations in 20 new countries and innovate and ramp out 30 more products, hey, maybe you should be you know, ahead of time ramping up your FinOps people because complexity is about to come as well. So again, speak yes. to people. That's when you find out what's going to happen and what you need to be prepared for. Um, We'll break for the speed round questions. This is where we ask our guests some quick, short, sharp questions to get to know a little bit more about them. Maddie, are you ready? I, I will do my best. <laughs> awesome. All right, your time starts now. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes, I can be good with that. Cat person or a dog person? Dog person, 100%. Red or white wine? Red. Beer or spirits? Spirits. Do you ask permission or beg for forgiveness? I beg for forgiveness regularly. (laughs) Your favorite movie, director, producer, genre? I don't know. Oh, uh, The Death of Stalin and I like dark satirical comedies. Uh, it would probably be my, my, my bucket list or my bucket of films. Nice. Tea or coffee? Oh, coffee, 100%. Uh, 
out of the way. Although in, in America, you have like American brown water. I, I've never understood that. Uh, favorite TV series? Currently, it's an easy one, but Ted Lasso. I model, I, I just try to be Ted Lasso while I'm at work now. I found that's a very good strategy for, uh, for, for happiness and success. Your favorite song, musician, genre? Uh, a band, well, my favorite band is Streetlight Manifesto, which is a ska band. Uh, and my favorite song would be Everything Goes Numb. Nice. Uh, buildings and architecture or nature? I'm a, I'm a huge architecture buff. I would like to run Vandalay Industries uh, one day from, from Seinfeld, but at the same time, nothing beats a good hike. That one is close, but I'll go with architecture. Nice, favorite food? Uh, anything super spicy, but I think specifically like a good tiki chicken masala is probably one of my favorites. Oh, and I question, again, I question the localization of the food that people get. Uh, holiday, do you prefer to do activities or feed up and do nothing? I do, I do, I do on every other. So I one vacation's an activity vacation and the next one's feed up in the sand. And I, I try to keep, uh, that's like my golden rule. If I did an activity last time, we're chilling at the beach this time. There we go. Uh, preferred superpower or supernatural ability? Mind control. This feels like a no-brainer. You know what I mean? Just get that's everything. really concerning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your favorite vacation location? I guess uh, Kauai in Hawaii is probably, I've been back twice. It's probably one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been to in the world and I would uh, definitely go back a third time. Text or talk? Text every time, do not call me. <laughs> These days. <laughs> Childhood nickname? Uh, Mad Dog? Still my nickname, honestly, but. <laughs> there you go. Uh, your proudest moment? Being on this show, no brainer. Oh, 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 here we go. All right, yeah, you scored quite high. You got like 94. Uh, I believe your interpretation of coffee got you there and also your passion for loving the pooches. So well done, nice. well done. All right, I'll take it. That's a good score. Yeah, absolutely. All righty, back on track. Let's talk about direction and vision. Um, we sort of spoke about this before, you know, there's going to be, uh, you called it tension, I called it friction because, you know, people are trying to move in other direction. Different teams have mm -hmm. different priorities, different managers want to achieve certain things. Mm -hmm. At some point, you've got to try and get that concrete direction and vision for the entire organization so you can walk and potentially even run together. Um, who creates the vision? Who's the owner of that vision, do you believe? Yeah, I mean, uh, first thing I think, you know, the executive sponsor is probably where a lot of the, the actual like execution of the vision comes from. I think the, the you know, again, the, the FinOps team, the practitioners who are close to the work and begin actually doing this probably craft a very grand vision for where they'd like to get the company. You know, I see this all the time. They're like, we, oh, we wanna bring in unit costing and we're gonna start, you know, splitting out shared platform costs for chargeback. And I often find there's someone uh, which wisely tempers the initial burst of like, we're gonna go from zero to 100 super quickly. It's the, it's the company's number one priority. And oftentimes that executive will say like, actually, you know, we, we have some big performance issues, you know, over here, we're working on a new compliance framework. You know, yep. realistically, here's where we're actually gonna start and, and focus at first. So I think the team on the hand, hands-on team will craft like, the overall grand vision for where they would like to take the program. But as far as where you actually start to like kick up dirt, like get off the ground, I think the executive is usually best in place to correctly purport, like apportion this with other strategic initiatives at the business. Cause I think you said it, like you said it already, you know, FinOps is huge and FinOps creates amazing returns on cloud value very quickly, but you're still developing products. you still have release windows. You still have, you know, global pandemics that could be shifting priorities in a number of ways. And so the team that creates the grand vision, I often find goes through an initial pass with the executive saying like, what can we focus on in the first three months, six months, and then, you know, a year later. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. Like I would, I would advise most of my FinOps teams, um, they don't need to boil the ocean on day one and save 20% in cloud spend overnight, right? I think it starts by building up that maturity curve and kind of painting a picture of 
you know, getting visibility around all of these different areas out to the stakeholders, you know, optimizing, going through a round of optimization to just achieve value quickly and showing people what is possible across the organization. And then kind of starting to set up automation and more like operational state, like tent poles. So how can we go do that again in half the time next month, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I think, um, you know, just talked a lot, but I'd say the the vision should factor in all of the grand plans and what you'd like to see, but then definitely kind of temper it down to say what is critical in the first three months, what is critical in months four through six, and then what are what are nice to have that we can start to layer in as we move from that crawl to that walk to that run phase. Um, I think trying to take all of FinOps off in one six month chunk uh, is incredibly challenging and, and I haven't seen too many customers do it very successfully. Yeah, and you mentioned the whole, you know, instantly take off a big chunk of our bill in the, in the first, you know, small amount of time. But at the same time, that, that's, a, that's something that I see frequently. As soon as you start to invest the smallest amount, you get immense returns. You know, the value to the organization from investing in FinOps is immense at the start. So it really is a no brainer to get started. Um, back on the vision, who else gives input into that vision? So you mentioned, you know, obviously, um, the the key stakeholders at the exec level, also you know the FinOps team. Is there anyone else that you've seen that really needs to have some input into that vision as well? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, if like if you're a large organization, I'd say your product owners are should have a huge stake in this as well, right? Because I think one of the things finance wants to do is, is you know allocate the data and start to to get some of these charges off like the central IT bucket and actually start to associate them directly back to products. You know, for showback at, at most organizations today, but with the dream of, of one day being able to charge back accurately for this data or for, the, for these costs as well. And so just aligning to make sure that like what you're going to create as a FinOps organization, the types of costs you're going to be tracking, you know, what you're going to be putting on people's dashboards aligns to what the product owners themselves actually are think about how they think about their products and what they expect to see. Um, I often find you know, we'll, we'll build a model with just a small portion of uh, an organization. And I think the product or product organization is notorious for coming back and kind of questioning the initial model. Like, hey, how did these costs get calculated? Do those really belong to me? Like, hey, I don't think this belongs on my dashboard. And so the people who actually own the products, I think have a big say early on because when you first light up that, that FinOps dashboard for their little slice of the world, they're the ones who will immediately be like, this doesn't have my X or, or that's actually belongs to that guy. You know what I mean? I don't yeah, want to see that yeah. on my dashboard. I'm not paying for that. Um, so getting like the, the people who own the individual products and services involved um, in those early stages, I think is another probably pretty critical team who has, they don't often say it until they see something. They don't know how much they care until they see the dashboard they don't agree with. Then suddenly they care a lot. Um, but I, if that makes sense. No, hundred percent. And, and I like that, you know, it's all this extra work, but at the same time, you know, we've never had this accuracy and granularity. It's not some odd, obscure, abstract model to say, well, this is what we think it costs us to have this business outcome. Like there's the cost that is yours. It's really mm -hmm. simple. It's, it's really clear. And all of this data is showing you so many opportunities to improve. Whereas again, you know, you've got to start to look for it. If you don't have that data, well, how do you know where to improve? Um, just on that, in terms of, you, know, so you mentioned some of the, the key steps along that journey, your, your capabilities. Can you give us sort of top five, 10, what are, you know, on that journey as you're building out towards that vision, what are some of the key steps? You mentioned there, you know, crawl, walk, run, vision. What are some of those things that they, they need to be doing and looking for and building out? Yeah, I'd say the first one is, is just some sort of allocation strategy, like whether it's based off of linked accounts or off of tag values, a combination of the two, but start thinking early about how you want to allocate this data and just you know don't, try to avoid shortcuts uh, around the visibility stage. I find every time you take a shortcut in that visibility portion, you know what, let's just make one account and we'll just put three teams in there. I'm sure they'll tag their stuff correctly. Like that's, that may not be the case if you don't have a defined, very organized tag strategy that's easy to follow. So I think getting the basic model for allocation, just we're gonna use accounts to define this level of the org, and we're gonna use tags to define these levels within the accounts um, is, is step one for building a successful FinOps practice. 
Um, step two is probably getting whatever we've decided as our allocation strategy out to the teams so that they can actually see the data in near real time as, as the data is pulling in. Like you mentioned, the engineers have never had to worry about cost every second of every day the way they do in cloud, uh, but they've also didn't get to see the costs, right? Like you didn't necessarily yeah. know the cost of your Cisco UCS blade and, and how point. long it was running and what hypervisor just wasn't something that was relevant. Now it, it is directly relevant. And so getting the data out to them uh, is the next piece. So once you've allocated it, finding a way to transfer it to the team in near real time. Um, and then just making sure that the teams see the data the same way. I find yeah. engineers often will use like, you know, estimated on demand rates from like a, a total cost calculator or something like that as they're building a new application. Um, but obviously cost comes in the actual bill in a very different way with, you know, custom pricing, amortizations, things like that. So just making sure, you know, we've agreed we're tracking usage based off of amortized dollars or based off cash out the door, however finance sees the business, making sure that's the same way engineers and executives and product owners are looking at their fleets as well. So, so just, just like on standardizing. That, you yeah. said like, make sure they see this data the same way. Is that like, I typically find like customers need to see data in different forms so that they can get the same understanding and, and the same outcome of what that data actually means. Is that, am I right on that? So, you know, you yeah, can present I mean, it in 10 different ways, but hey, we all understand is, that this is the where we're at type of thing. Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of things there. One is like, you know, what do you expect engineers to look at? Right, and what I mean by that is, if I'm an engineer and I log in, I, pr I probably don't want to see things like taxes or support charges or, or things, you know what I mean? Just different costs that might not be associated directly to what I'm doing. I find engineers typically just want to look at, you know, usage data over time, like usage times cost, while a finance user needs to kind of layer in all the other costs that exist on the bill um, to get that, you know, total number. And so when you go look at what you spent this month to an engineer, you want to make sure you can clearly frame like this is the usage. You know, if you if you need to care about taxes, here's the amount of taxes or support charges that are being billed out to you, and just understanding like who's going to look at what data and knowing, you know, if it's relevant to that individual. And so I say looking at the same data. In that case, I'm kind of meaning, you know, are we going to track against an amortized number? Are we going to track cash out the door? You know, do we have any custom markups that my internal business needs us to add to certain things due to like our central IT platform? And so just making sure that whatever adjustments, manipulations, or you know, edits that you need to do to your bill, everyone that's gonna look at the bill has agreed to what, what those are and they understand what's actually happening to it. Um, nice, you know, I, I like find that. Yeah, good, good, good insight in terms of making sure that we're actually looking, like don't just go and look, like we need to know where we need to look as well as actually defined yeah. areas. I mean, I think you'll find, I think you probably know this, but as well as anyone, Nathan, like in the cloud, so many times people are confused looking at the same data because <laughs> there's a different set of filters or you know, you're, you're focused on one region and that report's looking at all the regions. And so just getting, making sure that the, the data everyone's looking at is the data they're expecting, you know, has the right filters, the right settings, the right cost metrics. Um, it seems like basic just reporting cleanup, but I find it, it gets even the most mature organizations all the time uh, where you know, someone's just looking at a certain set of data with a slightly different lens and it's, it's completely changing you know, what they're getting out of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, organizational metrics. Organizational metrics, these are actually important. Uh, for anyone that knows me or has come across me, you'll know that I profusely hate obscure, meaningless, random technical KPIs. I'm looking at you, RI Utilization. Uh, so things that actually matter to the business are going to be organization metrics. These are things that should be getting talked about in FinOps. Uh, so let's focus on the ones that actually matter and that the people that are important actually care about. Uh, organization metrics. Maddie, where do these typically come from? Who's the source of these? Who has them? You know, I'm actually going to turn this one back around on you. So I, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I'd love to know 
what are the organizational metrics you like, Nathan? I would love to hear hear about that because I've heard a lot about the ones that you don't like so much, uh, and I'd love to learn a little bit more about what what do you actually recommend for an organization to track? Yeah, it's interesting, um, and I would say, sort of coupling on what you said before, like what does the organization actually do? What is your core business, and also what is your overall business strategy? You know, if you make shoes, well, what is the cost per shoe being made? That unit metric is absolutely fundamental. If you don't have a measure for that in terms of your FinOps and how all of your systems contribute to that goal, then you're not even at step one, forget about it. That is the first mm-hmm. thing you know, people should be ben- benchmarking. What are, you know, how do you measure what your business outcomes are for your customers? And on top of that, like to me, get that done, which I don't see a huge amount of customers actually getting there. They sort of, again, go to those technical things but also things that are supporting that. What are the other business um, things that you've got in the other projects, other um, things that you're working on to assist that? Things like innovation. You know, well, you know, how many changes, how many improvements to systems are you rolling out? Things that are gonna have a negative impact to those mm-hmm. other goals. So things like after hours. Uh, I had a great story here of a customer that measured after moving to cloud, they could see that their, the amount of features they rolled out to customers went from something like 14 a week to 80 a week. And their after call engineer hours went from about six to eight hours a week down to half an hour a week. So they were getting more out there and their engineers, nine o'clock, butts on seats, fresh as a daisy, excited. They had better staff retention. So what are all those key organization metrics that are sort of derived to that organization goal? I, mean, I think I think you definitely nailed it on some of the basic. I mean, the the basic ones like what is the cost per X of your organization, uh, and obviously like, you know, it's it's most companies aren't necessarily a Nike and even Nike like cost per shoe, right? Like, there's so much more that goes into it, and I think that's it's really important to like carve out the specific metrics that make sense to specific services and products in cloud. And then try to build that up into you know a more conclusive you know cost per X of the entire business. But I find, I think, uh, I think one of the ones that I think you would think is meaningless, and I've agreed is like I had a customer once create average cost per service, and service to them was like a small application, right? Like something that did something internally to the business, and you know their average cost per service was let's say you know a thousand bucks a month. But that doesn't really tell any sort of meaningful story for that customer because they have some huge services that do that run the entire business and they have like a tableau environment over here right which is totally different and so you know they had a couple of metrics like you know average cost per application or average cost per service and i was kind of thinking like by what quantifiable metric do you what do you use that for right like when are you ever like oh no our average cost per app is now eleven hundred dollars you know how can we attribute that to any one thing um, so definitely agree with the over proliferation of over technical metrics that are just doing math for the sake of doing math. Um, but I do love, you know, some of the basic ones is any, any service or application that's like processing transactions for the business. I think like a number of transactions is a super easy one, uh, that can drive a ton of really good value. And I also think like an e-retail or like e-commerce has another very option, a easy option of things like cost per, you know, purchase cost per order. Uh, cost per click on like an individual page. And those type of metrics I think do add some significant value to getting like, if we make this faster, what happens, right? If we make this experience better for a customer, what happens? And kind of being able to directly tie those back to like actual revenue uh, is very nice. I know my executives love being able to tie any sort of cloud service or cost back to, it cost us this much money in cloud and here's how much actual cash the business generated. I think that kind of like margins analysis is where a lot of my customers are, are trying to get today. Yeah, and I'd also throw in like when you're building these metrics, you know, do I have the right metric? Um, you know, making sure you're working with the right teams. Like, you know, do I need to purchase you know, some commitment discounts? Well, that's a financial thing. I need to speak to the finance team. Like, if we're going to purchase a discount, what do we actually need? You know, what are going to be the, the things that are gonna influence that yes or no decision on that purchase action. And I love to love to focus, um, John Boyd, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, person that came up with the OODA loop. And it was really around the decision-making process. What data do you need is the first step. You've gotta collect the right data. So think about that when you're building out these metrics, 
what is the data that you need to make that decision? Because if you're not capturing that data, you won't be able to orient, make that decision and take the action. So when you're building these metrics, make sure there is really heavy integration that you know, if you're gonna make a purchase, well, what are the requirements? Does it need to meet a certain level of discount? Do I need to make sure I purchase it in this particular way so that finance can attribute it and break it down? All sorts of things. So make sure that we're getting the right data to be able to build those metrics as well. Yeah, speaking of getting the right data, I'll just add one more thing. I love, I've had some customers have a lot of success, like kind of beginning to leverage like APM style data with, with kind of cost metrics as well for that kind of like unit economics discussion where you're looking at like, you know, a data dog or a new relic and you can see like, we made this change. We upgraded the instance. We moved from a legacy to something newer, right? Something like that. And we immediately noticed it increased my bill 10%, but it increased my performance speed or by you know or my response time by 0.8 seconds right that point at eight seconds led to 400 more transactions in my you know transaction product so even though i'm paying 10 percent more in cloud costs i ended up generating you know 20 percent more revenue in the same time period right because of slower loading times whatever it might be and those types of abilities of you know, isolating applications and really getting into the weeds of like, I made this change, it increased response time, or I optimized this and it, you know, that changed the number of transactions I was able to compute within an hour. That type, that lets you really start to get like very powerful around what features and what enhancements to your product are actually driving revenue for the company and what is just a new shiny button for the sake of a new shiny button. And I know we, we talk a lot here about, you know, trying to align the investments we make in cloud back to dollars to the business. Like we joke, you know, FinOps isn't about saving money, it's about making money. And I think being able to tie like your APM or your application performance data back to cost variables uh, is a huge part of being able to do that well and really understanding like how your company is, is making money through their applications. Yeah, and I like how like the last five minutes we've been speaking about this, we haven't been talking about dollars at all. It's all been about actual value delivery. And I think that's one thing that I tell customers, when you go to the cloud, you're gonna be doing things differently. Typically, you're gonna be doing more of what you did because you're able to do more for your customers. So forget about your bill. You go to cloud, your bill's gonna go up, but so should your revenue, so should your innovation. And these are the things that really, really matter. So um, yeah, good, good point. Like we're not really talking dollars here as anything that's really worth looking at too closely. Keep an eye on it but you've got to make sure you tie it back to the value as well. Um, so yeah. we will be cutting here to go to the mailbag question. So we'll do a little bit of a Scooby-Doo. Doo -doo 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 -doo. If anyone gets that reference, please feel free to email us feedback at finopsfridays.com. We'll send you a present. All right, and welcome to the very first FinOps Fridays mailbag. This is the mailbag where we answer questions that you have from the previous episode. So this is looking at episode number one. Uh, with Mike Fuller, where we introduced FinOps. We spoke a little bit about the FinOps Foundation and some of the main areas of work that FinOps actually comprises of. Uh, so let's dive into the questions. Um, so we've had FinOps for a good seven, eight years now. Uh, where do we think FinOps is going over the next seven to 10 years? Um, I'd probably say there's going to be obviously continued growth. There's been a massive acceleration uh, I would say definitely in terms of interest uh, over the last three years, I think that's going to continue uh, to accelerate, not just grow at the same level, but pick up pace a little bit more. So we're going to start to see, I guess, a little bit more formalization around that as well. Uh, there's going to be a huge demand for FinOps professionals from organizations. That's going to incur, I guess, a lot more formalization around the practice as well. So things like certifications, are gonna probably be a big focus, whether or not they be from bodies such as the FinOps Foundation or, or the uh, cloud service providers themselves, or maybe completely other independent bodies as well. But I think definitely formalizing the education so that if an organization says, I need to hire someone, they know what to look for. Um, the organizations are probably gonna formalize themselves as well. So in terms of making sure that they're hiring the people, those people are in good formalized positions, they've got the teeth that they need to be able to make an impact and actually make directions, decisions in the organization to steer and make the changes that are necessary. I think that's probably one of the biggest shortcomings at the moment. 
is that the FinOps person may not have enough teeth to get things done in the organization just yet. Um, and also from a tooling perspective, I think that's going to start to organize a little bit. Uh, historically, there's been a couple of front runners in terms of toolings that rapidly innovated, uh, you know, those sort of startup ideas. Uh, we've now seen a very significant increase in the number of tools that have been popped up. Uh, it's very, very easy these days from a technical perspective, uh, utilizing some of the tools that the cloud service providers have provided uh, to actually make a, a sort of a FinOps tool. Uh, I think that's probably going to start to even out a little bit and decline the more pressing challenges, things like integrations, things like features, they're going to be much harder to do. I think that's going to probably start to level out, levitate towards a smaller number of larger players and then some smaller tools as well. So what are the top three challenges customers, sorry, companies are facing when they manage their cloud costs? Uh, to me, I would probably say is understanding the challenge, the size and the importance of the challenge and prioritizing it appropriately. I still see organizations not really understanding that this is such a significant problem uh, and the whole FinOps space is just so fundamental and core to succeeding on the cloud. Uh, that's a lost point, people not realizing, not investing enough and really falling further and further behind. Uh, that then creates a bad workplace. They start to clamp down and there's that cycle of you know losing talent and not having the right people to be able to fix the issues as well. Uh, then getting on top, how do you get on top? If you've got a challenge, how do you actually get on top? Uh, you know, great way to look at this is if one of your horses is bolted. Do you catch that horse to get it back or do you worry about the half a dozen other horses that are gonna run through that gap in the fence? So being able to understand, do I focus my efforts on cleaning up the mess now or do I focus on preventing further mess from occurring? I think a lot more needs to be done on preventing further waste. If you look at the way the resourcing is done in a lot of organizations currently, you'll have a few FinOps people at best and you'll have dozens and dozens of people, developers, building the waste. There is no possible way you will get on top of anything by cleaning it up. You really need to attack the core fundamental problem is that people are doing the wrong thing. Uh, and that's really, my last point is that organizations from the business perspective don't realize I think a lot of it is coming down to them being the problem. Um, I wouldn't say that FinOps is anything new at this stage. It's been around for many, many years. There's a lot of resources in things like the FinOps Foundation. We have foundations about this now. It is well publicized. You can easily search for material to address the problem. So for me, the, the more I think about it, the more I'm pointing the fingers at the business, at the organization saying, you're not investing, you're not doing enough to modify people's behaviors. The tooling's there, the technology does exactly what you tell it to do. You are continually telling it to do the wrong thing. It is a people problem. I'm not seeing enough focus on that. I think to me, that is gonna be more and more of the problem as we go forward. On to the next one. Uh, we're a startup with growing cloud costs. When is the best time to start FinOps? Uh, super easy one. You should have started yesterday. Um, now, the challenge you know, with something like a FinOps, sorry, with a startup is going to be how much do I invest? Should I hire a person now? Should I hire a person later? Do I potentially slow up my feature rollout? I want to make sure I'm going to market as quickly as possible. All that sort of interesting thing you have when you have a startup. Um, but definitely, you should have started yesterday. It really is judging up. Building properly now, going a little bit slower or potentially having to rebuild everything later when you're at scale is really the decision point. Making sure that you're building things correctly now with a, a cost focus is gonna stop a lot of rebuild later. So don't just think it's gonna be a slow now and you're gonna to get to the same result you would have. Think about that rebuilding that may happen in the future. Um, so, but definitely start small. You don't have to go and hire a whole team and implement huge amounts of tooling. Understand that, you know, Again, parallel it with security. How much you're investing in security and operations, invest a similar amount in FinOps. The best place to start, uh, I did a lab with the Well Architected Labs. Um, you can have a look at the cost journey there. If you're gonna start, make sure that you're getting things like your data set up. There could be an episode uh, very soon around that. 
but you cannot do anything unless you have the data. So make sure you start with the right things, gathering the right data, turning on those data sources now so that when you do start to do some of the work in FinOps, you've got something to actually work with and you're not, you're not starting six months from now then having to wait for data to come through. So definitely start on some data, start on some architecture and some fundamentals um, as soon as possible. Okay, on to the next one. Um, how did cloud service provider X first, or where, how did they realize that surprise cloud bills were a problem for their customers? Um, for that, I'd probably say, look at when they started to release tooling and education. Uh, multiple cloud service providers have tooling that enable you to create things like billing and alerts and alarms. Um, but the challenge here is that it's really quite hard for a cloud service provider to know whether or not it, it's bill shock, it's legitimate or illegitimate. Maybe you've just released a new feature, you've rolled out a new game that's taking off and there's a huge spike in usage that's completely legitimate. They cannot possibly tell if it's legitimate or illegitimate traffic and costs. So it's always going to be really hard to sort of point the finger at the technology vendors and say, why aren't you doing more? Well, they're building the technology. The technology, again, it does exactly what you tell it to do. Um, so I guess it really comes back to the organizations that when are organizations really realizing they're not getting the value that they should out of their costs. And that's something that they should be focusing on more versus pointing our fingers at the vendors. So that is the very first mailbag. Thank you very much for your questions. As always, if there's any questions you have or any feedback, please feel free to send us an email to feedback at finopsfridays.com. Back to the show. So back onto the topic of uh, motivation. And this is one that I love. I, I really point the, my fingers back towards the business and our cloud bills went up, it's terrible. And I say, well, it's the business, it's your fault. You have not motivated the people to really care. Uh, you know, it's not my money, it's not my worry. Why should the, the, the engineers actually care about your money? You know, what's in it for them? If they build a system that goes down in the middle of the night, well, they get a call. If they're building systems that have security issues, chances are they won't be working with you for too much longer. So you, you've got to make sure there's something in it that then there's some intrinsic motivation that drives people to care about your money. And how do you do that? Um, and again, we're sort of talking about that friction before. You've got people screaming at your engineers saying, get this feature, roll it out, roll it out. Oh, but do it really cheaply. No one's yelling them saying, do it cheaper. Like, how do we make sure that there's enough friction and tension in all the right areas and we make sure that they're actually wanting to deliver some value in terms of finance as well. So Matty, what are we working against? You know, in a typical organization, when you work with customers, what are the things which are working against, you know, this beautiful golden yeah. financial efficiency? Yeah, I think the number one thing that I, when I walk into an organization and I can, I can usually tease this out pretty quickly based on some conversations with, with different stakeholders is, you know, do they have a data center mindset or a more legacy IT mindset where, where cost just isn't a variable that they care about, right? Like in, in the data center, it was all about capacity. Did I have enough? I'm gonna reserve a lot. In the cloud, obviously we know the capacity is theoretically endless if you're willing to pay for it. And so coming in from that mindset, like you said, I don't wanna get pinged in the middle of the night and I don't wanna have any security issues so I'm gonna build this thing as reliable and as powerful as they'll let me build it and then you know, sail off into the sunset, especially if you're doing a migration where you're doing this, you're building an application, you're lifting and shifting it, you're testing it, does it work? Yep, okay, back to the data center to get the next application. I'm not fine tuning this, you know, I'm too much of a deadline to really go in and fine tune this. And it's also a lot, you know, it's not the work a lot of our best, most polished, incredible engineers want to be doing. Right, they want to be architecting solutions, building fun, exciting uh, new products for the business, and I think that is the number one thing I see is someone who just doesn't think costs should be a part of, of their day job. Um, that is going away. The longer and the more prevalent cloud becomes, I think people start to realize that they truly do. If you're going to be given all the procurement power, and if you can buy any cloud resource you want, then that means that you're now going to be somewhat responsible for it, right? Like I can't come in the background and change your architecture after the fact, or it's very hard to do. 
Um, so that's number one, just people not thinking it belongs to them is one of the biggest like roadblocks in the organization. Um, the other is just, you know, engineers who are, it's not that they're not worried about cost, but they're just very locked in a, a constraint mindset around performance. And so they're not really building, they have, they've yet to start building things elastically to take advantage of like an auto scaling group or, you know, scaling functions, things like that. And so they're very concerned about, you know, peak performance times at all times, right? Like I've had a customer that wanted to size his entire environment to Black Friday. And we're, we were like, well, I don't know if that's a good idea for the other 12 months of the year, right? And so <laughs> that kind of approach, I mean, I've had, it's, it's very serious. Like, hey, should we, should we buy reservations for Black Friday? And that way we just know we're covered for everything. It's like, well, that's not quite, that's not quite the right approach, right? You want to be a little more elastic. So that's the biggest like got you, I think, early in the beginning. Um, and the number one way, again, to like get around this uh, is one, have a good tagging and allocation strategy early so that engineers at least know what their costs are. And they, they've like been socialized to how to see the cost data. They know what belongs to them in an easy format. And then as you roll that out, you know, as you get closer to show back and eventually charge back, you know, the easiest way to make these, to make other people at the business care is, you know, have them, if they're actually responsible for the cost. Uh, if you have a product owner or an application team who manages to a budget and is expected to stay in line with it, they will take a much more active role in, optimi in optimizing their own workloads then if that entire budget sits on central IT, no matter what they do, right? Yeah. And yep. so actually starting to push the ownership of this out to the teams uh, is like a super critical step and, and, and have them manage it on their own. Like it being a self-service uh, based approach is probably the number one thing I see for organizations that do this successfully. Um, yeah, and I like, <clears throat> also no, I like one of the things you pointed out there was around, you know, your, your days are gonna be numbered, you know, it's falling off it, this approach of just needless inefficiency and that's one thing um huge shout out to the finops foundation finops.org have a look get involved uh you know myself personally working at events like some of the large cloud vendor events two years ago we had lines out the door to get into things like cost workshops and cost talks if i think even a year or two before that um i'd have maybe two or three people in a line there's been finops foundation yep. has been instrumental and really driving so much awareness and so much visibility and really just creating and driving and pushing this entire movement around the visibility of the challenge. So um, yeah, definitely get involved in that. Um, and in terms yeah. of what you're saying there as well, Maddie, um, things like goals. You know, I love to say you're basically, when you jump on cloud, you're giving your engineers the keys to the sports car. It is just unrivaled performance and unrivaled resources. You, are you gonna give them some driver training so they don't just like, plow it straight into the first wall. Uh, and that's where, again, I love to point, you know, if you've got problems with cost, half the blame has to be on the organization by not putting in place some of those drivers, making sure that they've got KPIs on their engineers, that, you know, you need to make sure that you're, you're, you're building performance solutions, things on you know, the, the product managers. You know, it needs to perform at this particular level, so many requests, it needs to have this amount of uptime and it needs to do it at this cost, it needs to be there from the products as well. Um, and loved some oddball things like putting it on job descriptions. Every single job description that you have advertised needs to put something about cloud financial management. That tells everyone in your organization, everyone that's going to join, we care about this. If you're not putting it at the front gate saying this is something we worry about, what do you expect? You're getting the wrong people, you're not really promoting and pushing that idea. Is there any other little odd things like that that you've seen that really help the organization to change the culture uh, and get it in people's minds that, hey, this is my job. You know, I do IT, security is my job. I do cloud, cloud financial management is my job. Yeah, I'm trying to think. So I know uh, one of the things that I have seen customers do kind of just to speak of like building up a cultural muscle around saving money and it's a little, little wacky, but you mentioned wacky things. Uh, using metrics to start to associate cloud bills back to things that you know we actually understand a little bit better uh, i think we had one customer who uh, one, one i know it's like my engineers can't fathom what it means to save two million dollars like you know it's just tough for them and we're at such a scale in cloud so it's, it's confusing 
So instead I put it, you know, I show every engineer the amount of money over provisioned in like a number of FTE headcount. So like if you wasted a million dollars last year, you wasted, you know, 14 full-time employees that you could have hired for your team. Uh, and that's like, you know, an easy way to get them to start thinking about these dollars out the door are just that. They're, they're dollars being taken away from innovation, reinvesting in the business, hiring, all of these other different aspects of, you know, I'm sure the manager who built a very performant, very uh, costly application would love to have two more engineers on his team, right? And you start to frame it saying like, hey, if we can save this money, we can start to enable that. That's one way to do it. Uh, some more fun examples where I had one team that did it in cases of beer, uh, so they could see you know how many cases of beer were being wasted, but with over provision. And another grocery store, you know, they made the joke of, do you have any idea how many cans of beans we have to sell when you blow a thousand dollars in cloud? And so he made a metric that was really tracking for his engineers, like we have to sell two million cans of beans to recoup what you've spent in the last twelve hours, right? Like we're a grocery store, our margins are critical. And yeah, for finding, nice. you know, finding ways to convey it back to the team in ways that actually makes their brain turn a little bit, and makes the gears start to start to actually click, versus just saying like, guys, we lost five million dollars last year cloud overspend. Like it is, it is somewhat abstract. Like what what do you want me to do about it, right? Um, and yeah, so kind of being yeah. able to put it in a bite sized chunk right in front of somebody is huge. Which is why I also mentioned like the self service aspect of it. You know, one person from FinOps can't run around to 50 different business lines and do everything all on their own. But if everybody sees the data, has access to it, and can do just one or two things differently over the course of a week, you know, it can have a massive impact to the bottom line of the organization. Like I think, uh, you know, we used to call it death by a thousand paper cuts, right? And you can, you can be yeah, uh, cured yeah. the same way. And I would also, I, again, I love to double down and put focus on the organization here. Um, that they've got to come through with that. You know, not that they have to go and buy that many cans of beans, but if you're going to tell a team like, this is 14 headcount, and you give them no headcount, and you just, you know, from their point of view, pocket that money and goes elsewhere, well, I've worked hard because you said I could get headcount and you gave me nothing for my hard work. You're actually demotivating them to actually drive. So be very careful that when you, you look at these things and you want to motivate, that these people that are achieving the results are getting some reward. Uh, typically, you're going to have to do a little bit better than some um, cola, soft drink, and a pizza on a weekend type of thing. Like, make sure it's meaningful and it makes their their work life better. Headcount, absolutely. Some tools, some innovation days where they can do some fun stuff. Typically, I see that as being most rewarding. So that brings us to a conclusion of this episode. Thank you very much, Maddie, for joining us. Uh, if anyone has any questions or some feedback, again, we'd love to hear from you as we did in the mailbag today, feedback at finopsfridays.com. And we'll of course address that in the next episode. So don't forget to subscribe and keep up with future episodes. Thank you very much.